Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, one thing Jimmy didn't say is I'm, I grew up in France, but rest assured, I too hate the French. Um, the other thing that uh, made it that I grew up in France was my dad was an artist, a painter, and uh, I did decided not to go that way. So my only way of sublimating my artistic needs is through PowerPoint. So you'll excuse any PowerPoint geekness that I, I engage in. So uh, the name of the book is A Perfect Mess. Um, and you, you, people typically want to know uh, initially why uh, I would write a book on, on messiness. And um, the, I'm a professor of organizations at Columbia University, but I'm messy. Uh, and that creates a certain uh, tension in my brain um, because I'm supposed to talk about all about organization. And if you saw my office, it looks like a bomb went off in it. Uh, it's, it's really, really, really uh, bad. So uh, you can check out my website if you don't believe me. But basically, I, I got a bit as a joke interested in this subject. And then I wrote a 60-page tome on the subject of messiness. I don't recommend it. it unless you need something that's less dangerous than Ambien or something like that. But uh, I wrote, so I wrote this article, uh, and then I ran into, very much by chance, uh, a journalist who was interested in randomness. And together, we, uh, we wrote this book, A Perfect Mess. So that's a bit the genesis of the book. Um, I'll talk, but you should feel free to jump in, challenge me. Um, tell me I'm an idiot, do whatever you want, uh, uh, agree, disagree violently. The only rule will be no violence. Um, so uh, the book's been, to my great surprise, very, very, very successful. Not that I care very much. It's not false modesty. I like working on things, but I don't very much care what happens to them afterwards. Uh, but it's sold 70,000 copies. Uh, it was 100, top 100 in Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. Uh, it got reviewed, uh, got on TV. Uh, and the foreign rights were sold in 22 countries, which is even, so uh, that's the most astonishing part of it, that, that messiness is, is so interesting internationally. Uh, I think because capitalism generates lots of stuff, lots of objects lots of ideas, lots of possibilities, and that to a certain extent, we all struggle with messiness to a certain extent. Um, oops, 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 oops. Um, so the agenda for me is going to, I'm going to talk about the cost of order, because typically people think more order is better, and they don't think about how costly it is to achieve order. Uh, then I'll talk about efficient mess in space, efficient mess over time. Uh, here I'd like you to think a little bit of the car career of Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, who, uh, who went you know, from being a, a, a weightlifter and could have gone somewhere else, judging by this photo, uh, to being, an art, to being um, a movie producer, to being uh, or a movie actor, rather to uh, being governor. And he's notorious because he does not have, uh, until he was governor, he does not have a very clearly defined uh, agenda for his days. If something's interesting, he'll spend two hours on it. If someone's a bore, he'll spend two minutes on it. So order and space are people who, who have very, uh, in time rather, are people who have very, very rigid and clear uh, agenda, um, whereas mess in space are people who are much more, um, uh, that improvise a lot more in what they do. Um, I'll talk about mess and creativity. Uh, the two are, are highly, highly related. Um, we'll talk also very briefly about mess and power. We'll talk about how mess is a source of power and uh, mess and beauty, uh, and uh, different types of messes and how, how beautiful 
they can be. So if I can get through all of that in 45 minutes, uh, if we can't, we can't, and we'll leave time for questions, and you can uh, uh, ask in the questions, all right? Um, the, the argument in the book is not just about messiness in desks, it's messiness in organizations, it's uh, even messiness industri in industrial districts, entire industrial districts, uh, it's messiness in entire governments. So some of the arguments about messiness may be somewhat scale invariant, that is, some of the characteristics that work at one level of analysis may work at multiple levels of analysis. Um, typically, and, and this is somewhat amazing, and, and uh, people think very much about the benefits of order, but they greatly underestimate the cost of order and the cost of reorganization, all right? Uh, there are overly organized organizations. We use call, often call them bureaucracies. Um, a tremendous amount of money spent on organization, 50 billions on consultants, uh, but that we know that uh, a lot of firms fail during large reorganization. 70% of major changes are unsuccessful. Uh, so order is both costly and risky in terms of changing order. Um, have a number of examples of organizations that were growing very, very rapidly, not very, very organized by uh, standards that we would uh, accept in terms of bureaucratic standards. Um, they're then taken over, they're rendered much, much more orderly, and then they fail. And one of the reasons they did so well is because they bore so little costs of organization that uh, that allowed them to be so profitable. And once all the HR departments and uh, standard oper operating procedures and processes are put in place, all that cost of organizations makes these organizations less efficient. Um, Six Sigma is another one of these uh, current fads. Um, it's unclear whether the cost of order to achieve Six Sigma is greater than its returns. Um, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, so the takeaway here is to do a cost-benefit analysis of order, to think about, all right, uh, are we somehow in over-investing in order? And if we're over-investing in order, that means we should be less orderly. In other words, we should be messier. Uh, this, for instance, is uh, IBM's organizational chart. Now, do you know what an, uh, a matrix organization is, right? IBM has a seven-dimensional matrix. Uh, and in talking to a lot of people who work at IBM, they can't find anybody. Uh, it's just so complicated, it's so complex as a, a, an organizational form that it's almost impossible to find anybody. So that might be an instance of an over-organized organization, uh, and we could debate about that. But that's been my, uh, my experience in thinking about IBM. Uh, so high-level uh, mathematics, uh, the organization returns minus the organizational cost, me is equal to the organizational benefits, and oops, and uh, if the organizational benefits are less than zero, then we should have more mess uh, T plus one. Uh, so here's an example of mess, mess in space. This is a, a, a very interesting woman who runs a, um, a, uh, a very prestigious magazine. I can't tell you who she is. She would absolutely kill me if she knew that I was showing this photo to you. Um, this is not exactly what I have in mind. Uh, I'm, the book is not uh, advocating being a complete pig uh, and being uh, completely optimally uh, messy, me uh, completely messy. Uh, the book argues more that there's some kind of mid-level between uh, complete order and complete messiness. 
And that mid-level, that sweet spot, is where systems work the most efficiently. You'll note there's a ibuprofen bottle here, which I, I think is not completely unrelated to the state of our office. Um, so the book, so the claim of the book is not going to be simply, you know, be messy, be messier. It's going to be more, how do you find that balance of order and messiness that is optimal uh, for the situation that you're looking at? Um, we, of course, uh, love Einstein. Einstein was a very messy individual. He's the one who said, if a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind, of what then is an empty desk? Um, extremely, extremely messy individual throughout his life. Um, and a little bit of our, our poster boy for, for messiness to indicate that people can be very, very messy or moderately messy and be uh, quite efficient. Um, This is a, a, a funny finding that we, we so we did this, this web survey, not very scientific, uh, but it's the best that we could do at this time. And we find in our survey that people with an orderly desk uh, reported spending 60% more time finding things than people with a disorderly desk. Um, and a bit, I mean, I think it's, it's worth sort of thinking about why that might be the case. But frequently, people create very, very complex files um, and have trouble finding what they're looking for uh, in their files. They, there's also certain returns to scale to messiness. If you let 10 things form on your desk, you only have to do one trip to file the 10 things. Um, if you... Uh, uh, clean up your desk every time something hits the desk. You have to put it away, take it out, and so on. Uh, so there's certain returns to scale in terms of, of messiness. And then there's the more common sort of uh, experience where you say to yourself, I'm going to put my keys here so I don't forget where they are. And then you forget where you put your keys, right? It's an example of being orderly in some way, but then forgetting where you organized yourself. But anyhow, uh, our survey doesn't seem to indicate that uh, more orderliness in desks leads to uh, finding more things more easily. Um, uh, they, so there's this returns to scale of order, people who can't find what they've lost in, in their order. Um, there's another sort of argument is the opportunity cost of a mess. I don't know if you have an urgent task and your desk is, mer is messy, what are you going to do first? The urgent task or clean up your desk? Probably the urgent task. So there are a lot of efficiency sort of benefits to having a messy desk. Uh, and um, what's necessary is to do some kind of cost-benefit analysis. What is the ratio of time it takes you to clean up your desk to the time you save by having a clean desk? Um, and typically, people who have uh, extremely clean desks will, will claim that the cost-benefit analysis is in their favor, but there's not a lot of evidence to, to support that. Uh, I did a... I did a uh, I did a, a computer simulation of a moderate uh, messy where where so this is the degree of organization this is the returns to organization so how much time you put gets you more organized and this is a speed of task to completion so this is the when you get deeper into the pocket, it takes you less time to, um, to organize. And did a little, little like nerdy uh, three-dimensional simulation. And you see under most parameter settings, there's somewhere in the middle uh, where we find that a moderate level of messiness uh, is optimal. And this is simply a simulation which says, 
When you work, it creates a mess. Mess slows you down, and you can either stop working and clean up or continue working, all right? And that simulation seems to suggest a sweet spot of moderate messiness uh, across different par parameter settings. Um, um, The, the GUI computer interface is, is an interesting uh, instance. Uh, it, it was invented or discovered or, or designed by uh, actually a gentleman who studied desks. And he studied uh, 10 desks, five messy desks, and five very, very clean desks. And he found that, uh, in fact, people made much greater use of messy desks. Messy desks have everything you need right in front of you. Uh, they're easy to grab, easy to find, easy to combine. Uh, and um, he, he uh, used that metaphor uh, in order to create these GUI interfaces. Um, I don't know if I can do this. There's one. Uh, uh, how do I start this video? Uh, well, anyhow, this is this is a, a new type of GUI interface, which is completely based on the notion of messiness. Uh, they they have piles. Uh, it allows you to uh, look at what's in piles. It allows you to put a document a little bit at an angle in a pile so you can see uh, what you're looking for. You can move piles. You can recombine piles and, and so on. Um, so they're a kind of interface that completely takes advantage of, of messiness uh, as a tool, as an advantage in um, managing your computer. Um, oh, maybe it's here. You want to watch a little bit of it? Uh, no, not going to happen. All right. Um, Um, but if you get a chance, it's kind of fun to, uh, to go to uh, bumtop.com and see how they've, uh, how they've used messiness in terms of an organizing principle in the definition, in the uh, GUI interfaces for desks. Uh, mess over time. Uh, so we talked a little bit about Arnold Schwarzenegger. A, pe a person who's very orderly over time is a person who has uh, every 15 minutes of their day mapped out. Uh, Schwarzenegger is a person who never had that kind of a calendar. And the argument is that if you can have uh, that kind of flexibility in your calendar, that if you can improvise because your calendar is not so fixed, you can take advantage of many, many more opportunities than if you had an extremely orderly calendar. The same holds for organizations. Um, now, there are a lot of studies about the st strategic planning in organizations. Um, most of the studies seem to indicate that strategic planning is good for organizations. But surprisingly, most of those studies are carried out by strategic planners. So there's a, a slight bias there. Uh, those studies that are not carried out by strategic planners look something like this. Business performance, extent of strategic planning, if you can fit a, uh, a, a regression line through that, uh, good for you. Uh, but there's, there's really, uh, from what we can tell, no pattern in, ter in terms of the extent of strategic planning in business performance. Um, 
And once again, I think the argument is, uh, if you think of the Soviet Union and if you think of five-year plans, you think of sort of the inflexibility of strategic plans and how difficult it is for companies to adapt to new opportunities that come along. Uh, and you think of organizations that have much looser plans or no plans at all and that are capable of adapting very, very quickly to customers. It's a bit the same thing as Arnold Schwarzenegger, but now it's at an organizational level of analysis. Um, why doesn't strategic planning not work? Um, most of strategic planning is done without a real grasp of the facts. Um, less than 50% of CEOs could recall last year's sales for the firm. The only thing in studies that managers agree upon is whether they're in a big or a small firm. So a lot of uh, strategic planning is done with very, very bad data. Um, and that's maybe one of the explanations. Uh, Long-term plans act like blinders to new opportunities. And to a certain extent, that is going to hurt firms. Uh, and the argument that long-term sustainable competitive advantage is not sustainable is the third argument. Um, here I use Google frequently as uh, an example. I go to more and more more uh, on the Google website. And I give an example of all the different things that Google is trying out. Uh, almost like uh, an evolutionary process where you have a lot of variation. Some of it will work, some of it will fail. Uh, some the stuff that works gets selected and retained. Um, so the new theories of, of strategies say that you know, most, most competitive advantage erodes. Initially, you don't do as well because you're starting out. Then you start doing a lot better. And then you reach some kind of point where you've exploited all the new competitive advantage. And the new theories of strategy say you should then jump on a new learning curve that would take you up. The issue, of course, is how do I get on the next learning curve? Uh, let me skip this. Uh, and basically, the argument is that you have to do a lot of small experiments. Uh, now, those experiments, should they be highly correlated? No, no. all right? You want highly uncorrelated experiments uh, so that sort of a mess of experiments, really, so that one of them will come up and, uh, and have a chance of succeeding in bringing the company forward. So I use Google, maybe rightly or wrongly. You'll have to tell me, uh, as a company, that, that experiments a tremendous amount, uh, in, and I judge this from the website, uh, in the hope that they're going to be able to hit a couple of these blue lines that will take them on the next uh, learning curve. Uh, let me do the post-it. So investing in a mess of innovation, uh, you're looking at the cost, not the rate of failure. So you can have a very high rate of failure. What you want to do is you want to kill the failures very, very, very quickly uh, and let those parts, those experiments that seem to work uh, take off and become the next learning curve. Um, mess and creativity. Uh, one um, Nobel laureate called it the principle of limited sloppiness uh, in experiments. And the argument there is to be sloppy enough so unexpected things can happen, but not so sloppy that we can't find out what, it, what was the cause. All right? So a lot of great inventions or a lot of great discoveries, rather, have occurred because uh, an experimenter had a very, very controlled experimental condition. 
but not so controlled that something didn't slip in. There was a little bit of mess that slipped in. And, and when that little mess slipped in, that's when, uh, so you have uh, Louis Pasteur. Uh, um, I can get these slides to you. I won't go into great detail. Uh, but you have Louis Pasteur. You have uh, Alexander Fleming, uh, who had a very messy lab and let some stuff get into a Petri dish. Uh, and uh, he noticed that, uh, that uh, bacteria had uh, invaded. Um, and uh, from that, he deduced the existence of penicillin. Uh, there's big academic debate whether this is, in fact, how it happened or not. But it makes a nice story. Uh, but it's this principle of limited sloppiness. And there's instances, instances after instances of kind of sloppiness. And you can think also of an organization as one that uh, holds too much of a certain type of employee and needs to let in certain kinds of sloppy employees or uncontrolled employees or different employees uh, and could create sort of uh, innovative uh, solutions. Um, more generally, mess engenders creativity because it juxtaposes things that would have otherwise been separated by order. Uh, that's, the, the, that's something that we find at the level of desks, that we find at the level of organizations, that we find at the level of industrial districts. That order tends to separate things and when it separates things, we fail to see combinations that could be very, uh, now I use, I'm from New York, so I use the example of the pizza bagel, all right? It's a bagel with pizza on it, right? And it emerged because you had a Jewish community next to an Italian community, so you have a mess of communities in, in New York, and only because you have that mess can you have that juxtaposition of two culinary traditions and come up with the pizza bagel, right? But uh, this fun example, there are a lot of, uh, there's a couple of examples of uh, Nobel discoveries. One of them is by this famous Nobel uh, laureate. His approach is he'd have a desk, it would get very messy, and then he had a big roll of paper, and he would roll out another desk uh, on top. And then he'd start another mess. And then when that got too big, he'd roll out another. And he'd do this for a month until he got you know, sort of head you know, to the level of his head. And then he'd clean up everything at once, returns to scale to cleaning up mess. And it's in one of these exercises that he found two papers, one posing a problem, another one offering a solution without a problem. Uh, and he saw the two come together uh, as an idea that could be uh, path-breaking, sent the articles to both um, of the scientists that got in touch. And uh, in the story, this creates another um, uh, Nobel laureate winning experiment. Or I don't know how Google does it, but in a lot of organizations, people who serve the same functions stay on the same floors, work on the same floors. Uh, and when you do that, you tend, so if you have marketing, finance, operations, sales, and so on by floor, you tend to have an order of people like this. Uh, but certain organizations mix up uh, randomly and messily the kinds of people they have on every floor. And that allows for a lot of creativity because someone from sales can bump into someone from finance. Someone from marketing can bump into someone from sales. And again, something that would have been separated by order is uh, recombined in an interesting kind of fashion. All right? So, uh, mess, so the Nobel discovery, companies that mix functions by floor. Uh, we find that industrial districts with more varied companies tend to have more innovation. Uh, again, the argument is that when the companies are so different, they tend to find new kinds of com combinations of products and be much more creative than uh, industrial districts that have very much the same kinds of companies within it. 
right? So this is something that may be scale invariant in terms of creativity that what MESS does is it juxtaposes things that would have been otherwise separated by order and therefore it allows for new kinds of recombination and new kinds of invention. Does that make sense? Um, so that's the part for creativity. I've talked a little bit about efficiency, a little bit about creativity. Uh, oh, one more thing, why this book was almost not written. We, when we wanted to write the book, what do you think the reaction was? Where will this book fit into a bookstore, <laughs> right? So this is absolutely insane, right? You, you can't write a book because it's not gonna fit into an existing system of organization. Is it a science book? Is it a management book? Is it a self-help book? Uh, we couldn't answer that question, so they said, well, you can't write the book, right? Now, in truth, innovation or, or art, uh, according to Heidegger, creates new categories. It doesn't fit into existing categories. So, so when you come up with something new and you have a system of categories, it, it won't fit into the existing categories, and therefore, you get much less innovation. Um, unless you've got a flexible uh, system. Uh, mess and power, um, we all know the technique, if you create a massive mess in your work life, then it's very hard to fire you because only you know where everything is. Uh, if you're writing code, you have an advantage to writing messy code and not documenting it very well because then it's harder for you to be replaced, right? So this is a, an, an example of mess and, and power. Um, uh, with respect to uh, governments, a system dominated by power is autocratic. One that's uh, without power is anarchistic. Really, democracy is messy enough to let people do what they want, but not so messy that people one person's freedom will get into uh, the way of another person's freedom. So again, democracy in this way of thinking is a moderate level of, of messiness. Uh, and then ma moderately messy business firms have the same advantage. Uh, if you create a mess, you're the only person who knows where things are, you can't, they can't fire you. It's good for you, bad for the firm. Um, another example of a very powerful mess is a messy organization, Al-Qaeda. This is a, a network map of the people who were in, involved in 9-11. Um, and it's very, very hard to destroy a messy organization like this. It's very easy to destroy a very well-organized organization. You kill the top. You kill the second level. But a messy organization is very, very hard to take out, particularly if it's being attacked by a very orderly organization. It's not clear what nodes you need to take out of this system to be able to destroy it. It therefore makes it a very powerful system in terms of uh, its capacity. Finally, mess is beautiful. Uh, a Jackson Pollock painting. Um, again, it's a question of taste, and there are ugly messes, but there are also incredibly beautiful messes. Um, this is a, a, a Frank Gehry building. Um, again, question of taste, but I think it's the messiness of the architecture, the lack of organization in it, that makes it such a beautiful building. Um, I think I'll put this, there was a question of whether God was messy. This is a woman who found a random pattern on her toast of the Virgin Mary and sold it on eBay for a lot of money. So uh, again, uh, who knows? Uh, that's all, folks. Um, so uh, what I've said in short, really, is that the book doesn't advocate complete messiness. It advocates 
moderate levels of messiness. If you're completely orderly, you spend all your time creating order and no time to work. If you're completely disorderly, you have no t capacity to work. So there's something in between a moderate level of messiness that's going to be the most efficient. Um, I gave some of the arguments for why order is bad. Order is costly. Order is risky to change. I also gave some of the benefits of messiness, returns to scale, right? You let things pile up, and then you put everything uh, back at once. Uh, you don't have to interrupt yourself 10 times to refile things. You can let a mess form and then put everything back at the same time. So certain benefits having to do uh, with, with messiness. Uh, we talked a little bit about messiness and creativity, how messiness allows us to juxtapose things that would have otherwise been separated by order, and that by being uh, put together in the context of a mess, the, they allow, the mess allows for new creative recombinations and innovations. We talked a little bit about mess and power, how if you create a mess, you're the person who controls the mess, and it's difficult, therefore, to oppose you. And finally, we talked a little bit about mess and beauty. Uh, compare Soviet architecture, again, with its very, very similar um, buildings repeated against and again, and the kind of ugliness that that creates. Or think of a very, very neat apartment that looks lower, like nobody lives there and think about moderately messy art, moderately messy architecture, moderately messy homes that allow uh, the expression of the people there to come out. All right? So that's sort of my, my summary and my quick summary, my cliff notes of the book. Um, and uh, shoot, I have, you know, please ask questions. Uh, and I'd be glad to, uh, to talk about them. Uh, yeah? Um, my background is in entertainment. Um, I used to work in entertainment network television. Mm -hmm. And that fun little show that Dennis does is what a part of the piece is, ultimately. Yes. Making a bunch of little stations. But network television is horribly over-organized. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, finding finding the sweet spot is uh, is um, I think is is very contingent on the situation. This is where I'm going to dodge the argument a little bit. Uh, it's very contingent on the situation. I think it's something that you arrive at trial through trial and error. You try and be a little bit too organized, you see the problems. You try and be a little bit too messy, you see the problems. So by trial and error, you find a moderate level of messiness that's not too costly, that allows for creativity, that allows for some of the, the goodies that we talked about. But in part, the reason to write the book, to read the book rather, is to look at a lot of different situations where moderate messiness seems to work very well. Um, and maybe from that glean some of the characteristics of moderate messiness that are uh, the most efficient. But that's, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, yeah? Did you look into at all why people fear messiness? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, we found that. Uh, 60% of people feel extremely guilty about their messiness. Um, and so I, was, I had to write the chapter on the history of messiness. Um, and messiness in our Judeo-Christian tradition is seen as bad. It's, what, uh, it's actually satanic. It what, it's what undermines the religious order. All right, so from the very, very beginning, it has very, very bad connotations. 
then under the Industrial Revolution, you get the rise of engineers. And engineers believe that orderly systems, orderly machines, are going to be more efficient than. So then they take the ideas of machines and they apply them to social systems. So they say, if a machine works well, why not think of employees as cogs and of managers as, employ as, as uh, engineers? And why don't we run an organization like a machine? And then they don't stop there also. They then go on to applying the same principles to the family. Uh, we talk a lot about the Gilbriffs, who had 12 kids and who ran their family like a machine. Uh, they had them take baths and at the same time listen to German lessons and so on. Uh, they had all kinds of, uh, they, had, they used Robert's rules of order whenever they had a conversation at the table and so on. So this conception of order is good gets brought into the organization, brings it, gets brought into the family even, and gets, and, and gets considered as very, very important um, uh, historically. And I think that's the root of, of why we feel such uh, doubt, such um, uh, insecurity, uh, such guilt around messiness. Um, when in fact, there's not a whole lot of evidence that it's inefficient, that it's bad, and so on. Um, but that's, I think, the historical roots. Um, any, other, any other questions? Hmm? Yeah. Mm. And they talk about you know, how you need to clean up your inbox because your TA organize your junk so you have like to do list and you know, like project plan and all that. And so I guess what you're talking about is like it's messy, so is this sort of like counter efficient or like the same? Well ag again the the whole time ma management literature doesn't usually doesn't think about the cost involved in setting up your time management system. Um, so of course, if it's free to set up your time management system, to run it, to change it when your schedule changes, and so on, then it might be efficient. But it's costly to set up a time management system. And most people who set up a time management system don't stick to it. Uh, and ultimately go back to right where they were. There's also another example are professional organizers. Professional organizers will come to your house and they'll charge you between five and six thousand dollars to organize your house, right? And the question is, are you going to get five or six thousand dollars of returns on that investment, particularly since most people who are organized become disorganized over time. So very frequently, it's, it's so stupidly simple. People think, God, it's good to be organized. It's good to have time management or, or professional organizers or bring a consultant in to organize our organization uh, and so on. But they don't think about the cost of doing that, the risk of doing that, and the benefits of, of, of doing that. Uh, and once you start weighing the cost versus the benefits, in a lot of instances, you see that uh, time management is, is really uh, a loss of time, not a benefit of time. Because they're not counting the time for their creating their time and maintaining their time management system. Um, Six Sigma, do, do, you, and do you do any Six Sigma here? Thank God. Uh, it, it, it's another system which is extremely costly, not only to put in place, but, but, but also to, to really, really implement. And it's not clear that the cost of implementing that system uh, yields benefits uh, for that system. Um, so again, many instances of people who want to organize you 
but who ignore the cost of organizing you. Um, yeah? I'm wondering what you think about the potential psychological costs of not being organized uh, in terms of, and their effect on productivity. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, whether it's sort of innate or learned or whatever, um, a lot of people do feel, they just feel more able to think clearly, et cetera, when uh, things are not messy. Okay. Uh, A peace of mind, a kind of Zen state where everything is well. Lower, lower, anxiety. lower anxiety. Again, you have to ask why is there the anxiety in the first place? You know, is it for historical reasons or for efficiency reasons? It's probably for historical reasons, but. Yes. Well, there's, there's actually interesting, in, in psychology, the, the big five dimensions of psychology. Uh, and two of them are predictive of messiness. People who are more open to new experiences tend to be more messy. And people who tend to follow rules less tend to be more messy. Uh, the flip side of it is people who are close to new experiences and people who tend to fo follow rules tend to be more orderly. Now, people who have those psychological characteristics will tend to feel uncomfortable around messiness. Uh, people who don't have those psychological characteristics will, will feel perfectly at ease. I feel at ease in a mess. Uh, I, I, in fact, sometimes catch myself messing things up because I find them too, too orderly. Uh, so I think, I think there's, a, there's a psychological difference in how people react to, to mess that's... Uh, so would you say then that people should uh, strive to develop those characteristics that make themselves feel more comfortable around mess or simply choose the level of messiness that feels more comfortable? I think both. I think both. Uh, I mean, I think certainly you, we find companies that have uh, purging days or, or companies that punish employees that are messy. Um, there's one famous example of this woman who got fired because she had three personal objects on her desks instead of two, right? Uh, if, you, if, if you're passing rules like that, you're selecting against people who tend to think expansively and to not follow rules, right? So, so I think you have to be I think you have to be very careful um, how, how you apply these kinds of, uh, of rules. In a lot of these organizations also, we found that these get clean days, people open a drawer, they take everything that's in the, and they shove it into a drawer and they close it and then you have a clean desk. Uh, and, and that's how they, so I, I think, the, so there's the psychological aspect and then there's the technical aspect. The, the technical research shows that people who have non-routine jobs tend to be messier than people who have very routine jobs. So if you're constantly being bombarded by new kinds of tasks, you're going to tend to have piles of different things and so on. If you work at the motor vehicles department, for instance, where it's always the same task again and again, you can be very, very orderly. Uh, so I think, I, th I think there's, there's some technical aspect that sets the level and some level of, com of, uh, of comfort psychologically that sets the level that's right for you in terms of, in terms of messiness. Um, but uh, there's a lot of research to be done. I, I didn't, my history is I've done the research first usually and then some journalist has ripped it off so I thought I would rip myself off first, and then I would do the research. So that's a little bit why I, I'm following this order. But it's, it's a great question. Um, um, any, any other questions that, that come to mind? No? I've, just, I've convinced you. Moderate messiness. Mess is best.
Um, good.